Hello and welcome. I love instruments that have unusual characteristics about them. Odd design principles, odd quirks, strange stories, all of those things make me very excited. And so today I'm going to bring you one of the crowning jewels of my odd instrument collection. And it is this, the Couturier Conical Bore Cornet. However, first, before I dive into the eccentricities of this instrument, I want to spend just a moment talking about the man, Ernst Albert Couturier himself. My apologies for butchering the pronunciation of that name, if indeed I have butchered it. He was born um, in the second half of the 1800s. He started learning the cornet at the rather older age of 14, um, and he quickly became known as a player with virtuosic abilities. He was a, uh, by all records, an incredibly talented player. However, he was disgruntled, very, very disgruntled, um, at the quality of instruments available to him at the time. He, he uh, criticised, saying, I spend all of these hours practising and honing my abilities only to be stuck with inferior instruments. So he, along with a couple of ideas and a couple of mates, started the EA Couturier Company Limited. This model of having a musician, a virtuosic musician, dissatisfied with the quality of instruments going on to make their own is not an unusual model. The Meredith uh, cornet that I've demonstrated in a previous video has the exact same origin. Vincent Bach himself, the, the great New Zealand, no he's not from New Zealand, um, he himself also had the same approach. He started off as a musician and then moved into instrument manufacture. The EA Couturier company lasted for a few years until he sadly lost his sight at the, uh, in 1923. The company then sort of went right downhill, um, ended up being sold a couple of times, uh, and the poor fellow ended up having a mental breakdown and dying in a mental institution. Um, so we're going to gloss over those sides of his life uh, and talk more about his ideas. See, he had two ideas for musical instrument manufacture. And to understand the first one, we're going to imagine that we have an instrument completely unbent and untwisted and in a big straight tube. We have a small end at this end where we put our lips and blow raspberries. And then at the other end, we've got a much larger exit for that air. And in the uh, tubing in the interim between the two ends, we have some sections that grow slightly larger. We call them conical sections because the diameter at the start and at the end is like an elongated cone. And then we've got some other sections that are perfectly cylindrical. The tubing diameter does not change between two given points. All brass instruments have a combination of both cylindrical and conical tubing. In modern instruments, we have between 55 and 75% uh, conical, whereas we have the remainder cylindrical. Couturier's first idea was that in order to get the best tone possible, you needed all of your tubing to be conical. You needed the whole instrument to be like an elongated cone. Uh, he wanted to do away with all sections of cylindrical tubing. That's very hard when you've got the valve section, but he patented a number of ideas to build on and develop this concept. His second idea was that any tight bends that you might have in the instrument will add resistance and make it harder to play. If we look at this trumpet behind me, you'll see there are a number of fairly sharp 180 degree bends. He wanted to do away with them. And so we end up with this instrument here. This is one of the examples of his uh, various design iterations. This instrument comes from 1921. And you'll see a number of odd things about it. We firstly have this rotary valve here. This is not part of any of his sort of ingenuity. This is just a standard rotary valve that changes the key from B flat to A. The more unusual things that you'll notice is this splayed tuning slide. On a normal corner, the third and first valve tuning slides, these things here, are completely parallel. And because they're parallel, you can move them in and out to adjust the tuning. 
Unfortunately, to accommodate Couturier's ideas, we don't have parallel tubing here. We have tubing that is splayed. Uh, we have tubing that is splayed, and that is to accommodate this rather loose 180 degree bend that we have at the end here. The same approach is repeated on the first valve tuning slide, so we don't have any manual adjustment there either. The second valve tuning slide uh, here um, is parallel, but is soldered in place. There's nothing there to remove and to adjust the tuning there either. The only way to tune this instrument is via the main tuning slide, which is here. So that's really all I can think of to tell you about this particular instrument. Uh, if you have any questions about it, please feel free to drop a line in the comment section below and I'll answer any that I see. Um, and so to finish off, I'll play you a, uh, an extract of a piece of music for your enjoyment. Thank you very much for watching.